Okay, so last class, <clears throat> we left off um, looking, or all of last class, essentially, what we did is we worked through the proof uh, to show that the variance of the estimator for the mean is equal to one over one minus little n over capital N multiplied by the estimator for the variance divided by little n where little n and capital N are the sample size and frame size respectively, and one minus little n over capital N, we call the finite population correction. So as you'll recall, this proof was quite, in, uh, was quite long. There were many different steps along the way to getting to the solution, um, but containing this proof are, is the review of a number of different operators and some interesting notes about uh, the summation rules that you may or may not have seen before and um, might have to take a little bit of time to prove to yourself, but in each case, I think you'll find that these uh, little tricks will, will of course work out. Okay, so in regard to this finite population correction, we apply this to our estimator when the value of the FPC is less than 0 0.95 or the sample size um, is greater than 1 20th of the population size. So we have two rules on slide 30 or slide 24 here. Or I guess these would be rules for ignoring if we wanna be very um, conservative, rules for ignoring FPC. So effectively, before we work in, we look at our applications and we want to build confidence intervals and whatnot, we'll check to see if we actually need to use the FPC. And if we don't, then the form of the interval reduces to what um, you would traditionally see in most uh, applications involving confidence interval construction. Or most applications were inference, but the mean is the main goal. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so on slide 25, we're breaking down the notation a little bit more just to make clear the difference between the tilde and the hat sign. But the truth is, what we're getting at here is simply when we want to compute an estimate of the variance of mu tilde, instead of having the estimators in the equation, we have the estimates, right? So you can see here we have the hat symbol, and here we have the hat symbol. In each case, these are um, designating an estimate. Again, the rationale here is we are distinguishing between the population value, the estimator, and the estimate. So the estimates and the population values are considered constants in this particular study. So the estimate is a function of the sample estimate, which means that it is constant. But the estimator, which is designated by the tilde, this is the value that actually has properties. So the two derivations that we just went through were for the estimators rather than the estimates. But given those derivations, we can easily show or we can easily compute estimates just by using the values from the observed sample directly. Okay, so in this case, if we wanted an estimate of the variance of mu tilde, we would just use our estimate for um, the variance, the population variance. And we would use our sample and population sizes respectively to compute um, the, the estimate of the variance term that we are looking for. All right, so then we can say the standard deviation of our estimate is simply found by taking the square root of the variance. And usually when we are working with um, sample values like we are in this case, we would refer to the value given above here, which should be equation four as the standard error of mu hat. So we differentiate between standard deviation and standard error based off of whether or not the value is computed using the sample estimate or the population value. So the standard deviation usually would refer to the value that's computed using population information, but the um, obviously we're not gonna be working with population values, we're gonna be working with sample values. So we usually refer to estimates of the standard deviation as the standard error, okay? So it's a lot of lingo meaning the same thing. 
All right. Now you might recall from our study or your earlier studies in statistics that the inferential procedures that we're focused on. So for example, hypothesis tests and confidence intervals. In order to construct a hypothesis test or a confidence interval, we have to know something. We have to know what the sampling distribution of the statistic is. Now, when we defined our sampling distribution before, we showed that the expected value of our estimates are equal to the true value and that the variance of our estimates or, or our estimators in this case are also equal to uh, the true value are also are equal to uh, sigma squared over n, I should say, when we're talking about the variance of the mean in particular. We've already, we've already derived the um, parameters of our sampling distribution. So we've shown, for example, here, or we have already shown that the expected value of mu tilde is equal to mu and that the variance of mu tilde is equal to one minus little n over capital N, sigma tilde squared over n, right? That's what we've, the process we went through earlier in the week. So we know that we can standardize our estimate by subtracting these values, or we can standardize the estimator rather by subtracting and then dividing by, or subtracting the mean and then dividing by the variance or the standard deviation rather, sorry. This is the standard process of standardization. But what we have to, what we then have to know is if we go through this process, what is the distribution of this standardized value? So it turns out, and this probably won't be overly surprising that even if we're working with finite populations, we can still assume that a standardized value is normally distributed as long as we have suffi a sufficiently large sample. So this is the same idea that is presented earlier on in statistics when we first introduced the central limit theorem. And we basically say, well, if you don't know anything about the population that you're sampling from, or if you know the population you're sampling from isn't normal, as long as you collect enough observations where enough is designated as sample size greater than 30, you can assume that the estimator for the mean will be approximately normally distributed or rather approximately standard uh, will be approximately normally distributed. And then if you standardize it, it'll be standard normal distributed. And here you can see we have the same result. So even in the case where we have finite population size, we can show that as long as we collect enough information, we can still standardize our estimate of the mean or the estimator in this case, and have a standard normal random variable, which means that we can bound our estimates in a confidence interval format in the standard way. So we can add and subtract the Z score multiplied by the um, standard error of the estimate. All right, so to show that this is true empirically, we can consider a very small simulation study. So on slide 27, we have a histogram um, that represents the waiting times between eruptions of old faithful geyser. So this is a histogram that is clearly non-normal. So if we were to describe the distribution of this data set, we could start by drawing kind of a smooth curve over the distribution like this, right? And one of the clear things that we can see here is that this is a bimodal distribution. So we have two modes. And this would be lower mode one. And we would probably also notice that this is um, slightly, well, shouldn't say slightly, I don't know the degree of it, but we can also imply that this is left skewed uh, based off the dominant mode. Okay, so if we consider mode two to be dominant, then we can see that we have left skewness in this case um, with respect to, well, with respect to the peak of that mode. But the point is that this is very clearly 
non-normal. So if we start to collect um, samples from, if we consider this data set to be the population and we start to collect samples from the population and then compute means for those different sample sizes, we can study the distribution of those means. So in this particular illustration, we're going to assume that the population size is 272. So the histogram on the previous page was built using 272 observations. So if we collect samples of size n and we compute estimates of the mean for each of those different sample sizes, and then we plot the histogram of those means, we can then study the empirical sampling distributions of the mean for those uh, different sample sizes. Um, now, one thing that we're going to notice here is we will approach the, um, we will approach the population size fairly quickly. In our original studies on central limit theorem, we assumed that the populations were of an infinite size. So we could collect as many samples of whatever sample size we are interested in as we wanted to, because we had an infinite pool of information to collect from. So here, we don't have um, that ability because we, once we start collecting samples of say size 250 or size 270, there's only so many different samples that we can actually collect because there's only so many, diff so many unique points that we can actually sample. So what we will notice is that there's almost like a sweet spot in terms of sample size where you can really see the normality of the sampling distribution but as the sample size gets larger and larger, we're going to see kind of what I describe on the slide as a compression, or um, you're only really going to see one peak on the histogram because if you collect a sample of size 272, for example, there's only one sample that would match those characteristics. Okay. So we require the sample size to be, well, we require the sample size and population sizes to be large enough that the distribution seems reasonable and that the inferential procedures will work well. And again, the sample size that we typically, or the rule of thumb that we typically use to validate this is that little n has to be greater than or equal to uh, 30 observations. But the truth is that in practice, this isn't always going to be the case. All right, so on this, um, slide, we have different histograms of the sampling distribution of the sample mean for this finite study. Okay, so in all cases, we have the same population size, which is capital N is 272. So here we have a distribution of x bar when little n is equal to 2. And here we have distribution of x bar when little n is equal to 10. Okay, So each of these different plots are showing the sampling distribution of x bar for varying sample sizes. OK, so you can see that when x bar is equal to 2, we still have a rough bimodal shape, though it looks like the peak has sort of shifted sides, which is interesting, right? <clears throat> In the second case, we can see a very nice symmet symmetry to the curve. So what we're observing here is that for the particular distribution of interest, which is this bimodal kind of left skewed um, population distribution, when we collect a sample of size 10, our estimates from those samples appear to have a roughly normal distribution. Now it's not perfectly symmetric, but it's, it's, it's quite close to symmetry for an approximation based off of only 10 observations. At n equals 25, we can see a shape that's probably even more normal or bell curve than when n is equal to 10. But what we're starting to observe here is more of this compression idea that I talked about before. So the number of samples that are available to us is, is um, smaller than it was when n is equal to little 10. So this compression is a result of the fact that there's only so much information that we can actually collect from the finite population. But we can see that there is a normality type shape or a bell curve shape um, to the sampling distribution here, which again supports the idea that we only have to collect 
you know, samples of a, a certain size in order to assume normality for the distribution of X bar. Okay, and then you can see the same idea as n is equal to 50, as n is equal to 100, and n is equal to 250, we just kind of continue to compress the sampling distribution um, for the sample mean. All right. Okay, so one of the questions that might come out of this, and I mean, well, one of the big questions that might come out of this is like, what is the sweet spot for sample size um, when you are working with finite populations or even when you're working with infinite populations? We use n greater than or equal to 30 as a rule of thumb, sort of like a general rule across all of the different possibilities that you could encounter. But the truth is that in some situations, you can have a sampling distribution that's normally distributed with only maybe five to 10 observations, depending on the population you're working with. In other cases, you might actually need to have samples of size 50 in order to see the bell curve shape that you would expect in the sampling distribution. So we will return to this idea a little bit later and suggest the general rule of thumb. For the applications that we consider on assignments and, and on tests and whatnot, we'll just use the greater than 30 rule because it's the easiest one to sort of progress with the kind of exercises that we're gonna be studying. But in practice, what we probably would be inclined to do is model what we think the population distribution looks like and then collect samples of varying sizes from that distribution to see, to see how many observations we would actually need in order to achieve a, um, normally distributed sampling distribution. One of the other issues that we might run into or the other questions that we might have based off of this idea is what happens if these three quantities, so little n, capital N, and the difference are not all large. So in the context of inference, what will happen is our coverage, which is referring to the number of intervals that actually contain the true value will be less than what we would actually expect them to be based off of the percentage or based off the confidence level we are actually using. So what I mean is if we do not have the right quantities for the sample size, for example, and we construct say a number of different 95% confidence intervals, we're actually not going to have 95% of the intervals that we have built covering the true mean. The proportion of intervals that actually cover the true mean will be less than 95% because we do not have um, a sufficiently large sample size and because the sampling distribution probably isn't you know, normal enough to be using these approximations. Okay, so let's say for example, we have a sample size of 10, we have a population size of 116, which makes the difference between those two quantities 106. Um, for n is equal to 10, we actually only have a coverage of about 91%. So let's say we've constructed a thousand 95% confidence intervals for little n is equal to 10. We would expect 950 of the thousands to contain the population mean. That's the standard definition or interpretation of the, con or that is the standard understanding of how confidence intervals work across repeated sampling. And that's what we base our interpretation off of. But in reality, our coverage is actually only about 91%. So we only have 910 of the thousand confidence intervals of the thousand 95% confidence intervals covering the true mean. And we can see an illustration of this idea here. So on average, the green, val the green line here is, um, well, what we have on the x-axis are the sample sizes, right? So if we consider n is equal to 10, and our coverage is right about here. Okay, so sort of a crude approximation, but we'll say that this is about, is approximately 0.91 based off of what was written on the previous slide. So it does look a little bit higher, maybe like 0 0.92, but, okay. But you can see that as the sample size increases, 
our coverage increases with it. And in some cases, we're a little bit higher than the 0 0.95, but you can expect this kind of um, result when you're looking at empirical studies. Okay, But you can see that, again, the idea here is there's a sweet spot for the sample size that we actually need in order to be 95% confident in this case that we are capturing the true mean across the repeated samples. Um, okay, so now we can start to look at the form of our interval estimates. Uh, just before I get into this part, which will be, I think, quite familiar for everyone, does anyone have any questions about what we've talked about so far in terms of the properties that, or in terms of what we can expect from our estimates for varying sample sizes given different population sizes? All right, so um, going back to the initial idea, so we have an estimator for the mean. If we assume that the estimator is normally distributed, so essentially we built, we can build our estimator based off of a large enough sample size and our finite population size is large enough and whatnot. Then if we standardize our estimator, we have a standard normal distribution. Therefore, if we wanted to build a confidence interval about our estimate, we simply have to add and subtract a Z score multiplied by the standard error of our estimate, which is simply the square root of the variance with the estimate of the sample variance plugged in, or sorry, the estimate of the population variance plugged in. Okay, so from this, we can construct a number of different confidence intervals. The most common confidence interval being the 95% CI. So for most of the problems that we're gonna deal with in this class, we'll be interested in building estimates for the population mean. The confidence interval is the most natural way to actually give an estimate for the population mean that accounts for the sampling error that you would obviously expect to um, observe when you're using uh, only a portion of the population. You could theoretically also construct hypothesis tests, but hypothesis testing is a method by which we ask a question about the mean, and we're really only focused on giving estimates for the mean in this case. So the again, the interval is sort of our natural inferential procedure of choice. And if you recall from a confidence interval, you can actually infer how directional and two-sided hypothesis tests at varying significant levels are gonna work anyways. So we can still answer questions about um, the characteristics of the mean like you would from a, a hypothesis test based off only the confidence interval. So we have all the inferential interpretation that we would need from this method anyways. And again, it's a more natural way of building an estimate for a particular value. Okay. Um, and then the last couple points here, these are just reminders of how we structure our interpretation, but I talked about this when I discussed coverage. I mean, essentially just saying that when we interpret a confidence interval, we interpret it across, um, using the idea that we were sampled repeatedly from the population. So we're not sure if the, ex the specific interval that we were looking at covered the true mean, but we are sure that if we were to sample, say a thousand times, that 95% of those, or we, where we expect that if we were to sample repeatedly 95%, for example, of a thousand confidence intervals would contain the true mean. All right, so a numeric example, rather than listening to me blab about the central limit theorem, we can look at, um, listen to me blab about some calculations. Okay, so in this problem here, we have the following situation. So a simple random sample of 100 
uh, female diabetics is taken from a population um, with size 768. The total diastolic blood pressure of the sample is 7,007 milligrams uh, hemoglobin with a standard deviation of 17.5495 uh, millimeters hemoglobin. Estimate the population mean and include an approximate 95% confidence interval. Okay, so a pretty straightforward problem actually in context of application, but this is um, representative of what you're being asked to do on the assignment. So here, we have little n is equal to 100. We have capital N is equal to 768, All right? We have the total for the sample size or for this, the total diastolic blood pressure is 7,007 uh, milligrams hemoglobin, right? So we effectively have here n times mu hat is equal to 7,007. Uh, we have a standard deviation of 17.5495. Okay, so we wanna estimate the population mean. That's the first thing. Okay, so our estimate of the population mean um, is going to be, in this case, the total. So let's say little n. Wow. Okay. We'll just write it out the proper way. So this is going to be the sum for all i and u of the values that are included in the sample divided by the sample size. So in this case, we're going to have 7,007 divided by 100, which is 70.07. Okay, so this would be the point estimate of the population mean for this particular problem. Okay, and now we want to include an approximate 95% CI. Okay, so approximate... Ninety-five percent CI. Okay, so our CI is going to have form uh, Z alpha over two multiplied by the standard error of mu hat. All right. So in this case, alpha is going to be one minus zero point nine five which is 0 0.05. So we're going to have Z 0 0.05 over 2, which is Z 0 0.025, which you will likely recall is 1.96. So the Z score for a 95% interval, it's kind of that standard magical value. And then we also need to compute the standard error of mu hat. Okay, so this is going to be the square root of one minus little n over capital N multiplied by sigma hat squared over little n. So we'll have one minus, oh, actually we need to uh, check this first. Um, okay, so this is going to be our standard error and then just before we proceed with this calculation, we're gonna to check to see if we need to use the FPC. Okay, so basically what we're asking is, um, is um, one minus little n over capital N greater than or equal to 0 0.95. So let me make sure I have that rule correct. Yes. Okay, so we have one minus 100 over 
768 is less than, okay, so since one minus 100, 768 is less than 0 0.95, then we can use the FPC. Okay, so now we can say this is one minus 100 over 768 divided by 17.5495 over 100. Sorry, that would be squared. And that gives us 1.665. Okay. All right, so then we're going to have 70.07 .07 plus or minus 1.96 multiplied by 1.665. And that gives us 70.07 .07 plus or minus 3.213432. Which gives us 66.857 to 73.283. Okay, so then we can say something to the effect of we are 95% confident that the uh, population mean. Systolic, systolic, right? Diastolic. Uh, blood pressure. Of diabetic. is between 66.857 and 73.283 millimeters hemoglobin. Now, one thing I forgot to mention just at the very start here is we have a sample size of 100. So we're assuming that the sampling distribution is approximately normal because we have a sample size that's greater than 30 in this case. And typically we would note down sort of a standard check of assumptions for this procedure. So in this case, we're working in the context of SRS. So this is would be an SRS estimator from you. The question states that a simple random sample was taken. So that's um, a safe assumption that we're working in the right paradigm. And then again, the normal, the finite normality approximation or rather the finite central limit theorem essentially says that, well, based off of the work that we cited, the HADJAC 60 paper, that we can assume um, our estimator is going to be approximately normal since we collected more than 30 observations. Okay. So for the most part, hopefully what you can see here is that the process of actually estimating the mean is very similar to what we saw before. And um, the only real difference here is we're checking the finite population correction and whether or not we can use it. But outside of that, it's the same process that we've studied um, in, our previous, in our previous studies of confidence intervals as well. So this should be quite familiar to you, but we just have this um, finite population correction in the um, estimator for the variance. Uh, does anyone have any questions 
All right, so ah. <laughs> All right, so the other um, you know estimator that we have to talk about is the estimator for the population total, and this is the last thing we need to finish off the assignment. So the population total, which we designate as tau. Is, um, is actually simply the population size multiplied by the population mean, right? So in the previous slide, I actually used the notation little n multiplied by mu hat to represent total. So if you think about the sum across all observations in a sample, that would be the total sample or the total of the variable count, if you will, for the sample. So the population quantity would follow pretty naturally from that. So if we wanted to estimate the population total tau, the natural estimator would be capital N multiplied by the estimator for mu tilde. Okay, so from that, we can make a few different notes here. So tau, I don't know why I draw tau is equal to capital N multiplied by mu, tau tilde, which I have above is capital N multiplied by mu tilde and tau hat is equal to capital N multiplied by mu hat. Okay. All right, so from this, whoa, we can very quickly show the form of the estimators for tau. So for exact, for example, the expected value of tau tilde is simply n times the expect is yeah sorry is the expected value of n mu tilde, which is n times the expected value of mu tilde, which is n mu. Um, the expected value of or sorry, the variance of tau tilde is equal to the variance of n mu tilde, which is n squared times the variance of mu tilde, which we worked out beforehand, right? So this is basically just n squared one minus little n over capital N sigma squared tilde over little n. And then it's easy to show that the standard error of tau tilde is simply going to be the square root of the variance, which is equal to n multiplied by the square root of 1 minus little n over capital N sigma tilde squared over little n. Okay. So if we wanted to bound or build a confidence interval about our estimator for the population total, we can say the following. A one minus alpha times 100% confidence interval for tau has form tau hat plus or minus z alpha over two multiplied by the standard error of tau hat And then you can see here from the form of the estimator for tau hat that this is actually, we can write this as n mu tilde plus z alpha over two times n multiplied by the standard error of mu hat. So basically if we wanna compute a 95% CI for an estimate of the population total, um, we simply have to multiply our bounds 
for mu and the value of mu by capital N. So the process is actually exactly the same as it was in the previous illustration, except that we just have to account for the population size. So on slide 36, I have an example of how we would bound the estimate. Now, effectively, when we say we want to bound an estimate, that means that we want to compute the margin of error. All right. So in this sample, we have the same details that we had above. So a sample size of 100, a population size of 768. We have an estimate of mu being 70.07 millimeter hemoglobin, and we have an estimate of um, sigma hat being 17.5495 mill millimeter hemoglobin. All right, so we want to place a bound on the estimate of the population total. So first off, let's just write out our estimate of the population total. Or tau is going to be tau hat, which is capital N times mu hat, which is 768 multiplied by 70.07, which is equal to um, 53,813.76. Okay, and now we want to bound uh, tau hat. Okay, so B, which we will designate our bound, is simply the margin of error for the confidence interval. So that's going to be the Z score, which is going to be multiplied by N times the standard error of mu hat in this case. Okay, so let's use a 95% CI. Use alpha equals 0 0.05, for example. Okay, so then we're going to have 1.96 multiplied by the population size multiplied by the square root of one over little n times capital N, sigma hat squared over little n. I guess I got a little bit ahead of myself there. <laughs> now I have different constants in here. Um, so just for consistency, sorry, we'll just call this Z 0 0.025 capital N. And now we can go 1.96 multiplied by 768, 1 minus 100 divided by 768 times 17.5495 squared divided by 100. And that gives us 2,497.91. Six, sorry, 2,467. So how do I, so can you tell me why the alpha you use to 5%? I just chose it randomly. Means uh, we choose randomly, always 5%? <clears throat> okay, well, let's say that, um, let's say that the 5% is the standard significance level. So if it isn't stated in the question, you can assume alpha 0 0.05. Okay. Okay, thanks. All right, so... That's our bound for the population total. And again, I think everyone should be able to see that if you wanted to construct a, a confidence interval for the total, in this case, a 95% CI, let's say, you're simply taking tau hat plus or minus the bound. So the bound is really just the margin of error in this case. Um, okay, so referring back to the assignments, um, so question one is fine. Question three, four, and five are also fine. Um, all right, so question two is referring to the population proportion. And for this particular question, we haven't actually discussed the population proportion yet, though if you read ahead in the slide, slide to slide 44 and slide 45, you can see the definition of the ZI. And that's the only thing that's really missing, I think, in terms of working through this problem. The idea is exactly the same as it was before, except that now we're working with an indicator. Um, now we're working with binary data. Um, instead of continuous data. 
So, um, I think probably the fairest thing to do. So I want to keep the assignment date on Monday. All of the assignment can be completed except for, I mean, technically you, we haven't studied question two yet. I haven't defined the population proportion in detail in lecture yet. So I think just to be fair, I'll just take question two and I'll move it to the next assignment. Um, I still think you can probably answer this question anyways, but it's only three marks. So it's, it's not really a big deal if I just, if we just shift it forward one assignment. So I'll make an announcement, but for Monday from assignment one, uh, questions one, three, four, and five are due. And then question two will be shifted to um, the next assignment. On Monday, again, I'll be teaching from McEwen and obviously you're welcome to join on campus. The following Monday, we have our first quiz. And um, after Monday, I'll post assignment two and I'll, I'll send a recap of all of these details by email as well. So as always, if you guys have any questions, uh, please let me know. And if not, I will talk to you guys on Monday morning at nine.